uh, welcome to our today's uh, Knowledge Cafe. It's such an amazing session where we'll be discussing about um, decolonization of knowledge. This is an action plan for came for deaf and it has been a discussion of the previous uh, Knowledge Cafe where we uh, were looking at the decolonization of knowledge. And then there was that discussion about um, uh, the uncomfortable truths in the development sector. It is also um, worldwide a hackathon events and kindly uh, the people who are joining welcome and also share with us where you're joining from. Today we have more than 100 countries uh, which are being represented and the section of this session we are going to develop an action plan and every one of us is highly uh, required to just be there for the end of the session because our action counts, our um, voice comes towards this contribution uh, of the uh, camp for deaf action plan in decolonization of knowledge. And then there will be another next uh, knowledge cafe where we'll be having the Asia Australian team that will be on May 20th. Um, we'll be having uh, Bruce and Srivita uh, leading with us. So for those who may not be able to join, you're welcome for the next one. And also, um, you can find out the other uh, discussion um, about the contribution of members regarding the, uh, the decolonization of knowledge in our game for the um, blog and also in our um, chat discussion. And then uh, we have students from Nankin University that have been so kind and they have compiled a contribution about this um, team. And because this is a sensitive matter that we are going to discuss today, we just kind of request all of us to be kind to each one of us. And now, without further ado, I need to hand over to my colleague, Sarah. Uh, Ellen is going to introduce the speakers and the other things and the next session about the, the cafe. So welcome, everyone. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm one of your facilitators today, Jorge is my co-facilitator. Uh, I'm Helen Gilman and a longtime member of CAIM for Deb and until recently I led knowledge management at EFAD, one of the UN organisations based in Rome and three weeks ago I retired. Um, and as Nancy White helpfully suggested, I'm currently rewiring. So <laughs> hand over to Jorge. Thanks. My name is Jorge and I'll be facilitating this session together with uh, Helen. I'm also part of the core group of KM for Deaf and I've been uh, also facilitating other sessions uh, before. I haven't retired yet, unfortunately, <laughs> but um, well, that doesn't mean that I cannot join you here. Um, a very few of uh, basic uh, yeah, information stuff before we start. Please, of course, keep your microphones uh, off while, while we're having speakers. Um, and another important thing is uh, remember that this session is going or it is already being recorded. So by staying, you accept that we record this and that you may well appear um, in it. Um, we will be well having a, a tight program as usual. We will have uh, two speakers. And we will try to have uh, two breakout sessions where we will go into groups and we will ask you all to participate uh, during the groups. We will not have time enough, I'm afraid, for feedback from all the groups, but we would still like to encourage you to come up with questions after the presentations and, of course, to share a few of the ideas after the breakout groups. So uh, we will be perhaps a little bit informal here in trying to get your opinions or suggestions. Um, but at the same time, uh, please remember that we have the chat option. I see that a lot of people are already writing and uh, somebody's, uh, yeah, suggesting that I would retire. No, not yet. Um, use the chat about this. Uh, remember, we keep this chat. It's always a possibility of not just uh, sharing ideas with everybody, but also between ourselves. So um, we will try to keep with the time. Of course, that's always a bit difficult because we have a lot to say, and especially because this is a bit of a, I would say, a difficult issue where um, to express ourselves, to share ideas, but let us try to participate as much as possible. So with this, we are ready to start. Helen. Yes, um, 
I'd like to introduce Euphrasia Luceca. Euphrasia, are you with us? I hope she's, oh yes, I can see her, there she is. Um, Euphrasia, is, um, Euphrasia is a Kenyan. She's a water governance expert um, with 12 years of experience uh, in, the, in the wash sector, nationally, regionally, and also internationally um, in leadership strategy and management. Uh, she specializes in WASH public policy and institutional strengthening and has a very keen interest in, in uh, knowledge management for development. Um, Euphrasia, yes, she, there she is. She's going to um, sort of speak from her own experience about what she's doing as um, an individual to uh, in this very broad and, and difficult theme. Euphrasia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I bet everybody might be wondering, like, you know, she's from the WASH sector, what is she doing with the knowledge agenda activities? But I would say um, for the WASH sector, we are usually keen on SDG 6 uh, agenda. It's mainly on ensuring that there's safe water and sanitation for all. And um, I feel like the business models for knowledge management and development especially in our sector have to be inclusive. And by uh, and, and large, I would say that for us to be able to attain SDG 6 on time, uh, given that we have a, a, like very few years to go, we need to see how we can be able to incorporate the role of knowledge management and development. Otherwise, attaining SDG 6 is going to remain a fallacy. So, um, the, the, the reason why for me I feel like knowledge management and development is so critical on the issues of inclusion and uh, diversity and equity uh, and, and now bringing it from the perspective of decolonization is simply because it's the knowledge that the KMD um, experts are collecting that is used to now to inform policies, to inform resource allocation, to inform um, human resources and generally the whole procurement, to inform how an organization is going to be structured and the likes. So um, this is why KMD is so important and this is why, again, it has to be decolonized. So for me, I, I'm, I'm giving you more of like a reflective inquiry on the same. And at the same time, I want to take an appreciative uh, approach. Uh, I think Gladys has been quite clear that this is quite a sensitive issue. And it being so sensitive, we don't want to have a divide, but we want to just see how we can be able to work together to address the issue. So I have worked in the water sector for the past um, 12 to 13 years. And I would say we have been seeing a lot of challenges, but last year is when I really felt like this whole problem of decolonization is coming out really strongly. And Bruce uh, Boys, she is part of the group. There's an article that he has written and he indicates that much as physical colonization has ended in the countries in the North, we still have um, some knowledge colonialism uh, continuing. And this was exhibited a lot uh, sometime last year for me. Um, I mean, I'm a member of, of, of Women in Water Association in Kenya, and when COVID-19 was at its height or at its peak around June, or was it around May uh, in my country, we could see a lot of webinars happening. But interestingly, people are talking about African issues, and they are all the way at the north, you know? And people felt neglected in a way, in terms of the WASH experts, they felt neglected in a way that they are implementing the work, but they are not telling their stories, you know, and they're not getting the platform to also be able to share it. And I remember it got to a point where even members were refusing to attend some of these uh, activities if there's no African, or if there's no woman, or if there's no uh, youth being represented. Then, um, at, at the same time, at, at the same time, we were wondering about um, a, a lot of documentation that again was coming in into the sector. Uh, at this time, uh, at that time, what was happening is we could also see a lot of like what I call parachuting of experts. They come from the other regions from the north, and they come into the country in Kenya. 
the right stories about our sector. And uh, for this case, it was rural water sector. So under the rural water sector agenda, they come up with stories and the stories do not have even one author that is Kenyan. Uh, at the same time, uh, even in terms of citation or even in terms of knowledge, uh, in terms of uh, data collection, they were only asking us the basic things that they usually ask, you know, like how far is it, uh, how, how far does it, I, I mean, how long does it take you to fetch uh, safe water? So at that time, you're also wondering, are we as Africans knowledge consumers only, or are we also knowledge producers, you know? So again, COVID-19 issues really highlighted the gap even more. You know, with how COVID is, it's about the knowledge, the perspective of know why. It's not just about know what, you know? And given uh, the know why uh, perspective in terms of knowledge development, uh, it means that all these issues are really contextualized. So it again really brought out that gap that, you know, we really need to be able to talk with Africa and not talking to Africa. And I felt like nobody again in my sector was coming up with these issues. I think again, uh, I and I would say it uh, confidently that humility is really costing us as Africans. So um, in, 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 that, in that regard, I just decided to come up with a write-up uh, on, on decolonizing the wash knowledge uh, generally. And I would say it did extremely, extremely well. It has changed a lot of things in the sector. Uh, between last year, there was like a whole APRO uh, in knowledge platforms for, uh, for water issues. We were having like um, so many people actually even reaching out to me to tell me, you know, Euphrasia have really done an interesting article and they've really come out strongly to talk about it. And these are things that we need to be able to change. And, uh, much as a lot, I wouldn't say like a lot has been done between then and now, because again, it's so sensitive uh, in a way, but still I think we have a lot of gains that we can be able to really loud uh, on, and we can again be able to create mileage uh, upon. Currently, uh, we are, I'm actually getting involved in so many uh, research uh, activities on the same, on how to work out on the knowledge content for the wash sector. And I, I would say, um, in terms of being an individual, there are some few points that I was trying to come up with in terms of the focus areas because of the time. I would say first and foremost, we need to change our mind because if you can't change your mind, you cannot be able to change anything. We need to get to a level where we can say that these things are not happening right and I'll put my foot down on it and I will come out loudly and I'll come out boldly and talk about it much as maybe somebody might not might feel offended about it, but these are issues that need to be discussed and we cannot continue sitting uh, down on them because again, when you look at the issues of decolonization, it's not a zero sum game. Uh, in our sector, for instance, we are losing 323 billion per year on bad water and sanitation uh, projects. And you see, this is coming from the perspective of poor knowledge development and all. If you capture it in the wrong way, then you're totally, uh, you're, you're totally done. Then um, also, I would say, uh, when we're given opportunities to discuss these issues, let us be loud, let us be proud about it. Let us step up, basically, and let the voice of Africans be able to be heard. There's just too much that a Northerner who's supporting the colonization agenda can be able to do. So even for us as Africans, we have a big role to play and we need to step it up. Then um, this stepping up can be done in so many ways. We can uh, participate in writing and being vocal about the issues. I've not seen a write-up uh, I, I did see a writer for a long time uh, last year after I mentioned what I did. I think it was around like three months later that people are now coming up to talk about it. But again, uh, now we have more people discussing uh, about the issues. So let us be loud. Let us be proud. Let us take um, uh, take uh, take take up the spaces that you are being given and platforms uh, to raise uh, to raise the issues. Then. Um, Let's, again, in terms of knowledge uh, development, let us talk about Africa. Let us cite Africa as well uh, in knowledge uh, materials. It doesn't make sense really for 
any product to be developed for Africans and it doesn't have even one citation from Africa. And even when you're talking about research experts and all, in terms of recruitment, let it be truly equal opportunity employment, equal opportunity up to the level of payment, equal opportunity up to the level of rights of the documents that we are producing. Um, I would also say, um, let's let's continue producing uh, research products especially to feed into the issues to do with data you know let let it come out strongly because policies and uh, any decision making is informed by data it's informed by what you are trying to produce so the knowledge management and development experts have a big role to come up with research agenda on uh, BIPOC uh, issues, and this can be able now to inform policies best. Because again, when you look at the policies that were developed um, last year, uh, even on issues to do with uh, inclusion, you will notice that they were just one-liners. And if we come back into the organizations today, um, not so many people have been able to be accountable in terms of reaching uh, in, ter in terms of reaching the objectives of what is indicated in the policy. Nobody is monitoring um, what has been able to be attained. So there's no accountability, it's just discussion. Then um, as I come to a close, I would say, um, let's get allies, you know? Allies in terms of people who will help us as Africans as well or, or Northerners to be able to, I mean the Southerners, to be able to now tell our stories better. I remember like immediately I wrote my paper, uh, I mean my article, it didn't get a lot of uh, views and all until the information manager at IRC called um, Cor. Uh, he's the one who came out strongly, did a whole um, talk uh, with me and another lady on the colonization issues and wash from a systemic perspective. And from there, we had like a whole ripple effect in the sector. So let's look for allies who can be able to publicly come in and support us. But they're not just indicating that we support inclusion, uh, <laughs> probably <laughs> amongst people, but they can deliberately come out like what Sarah did, um, I, I think in the course of the week on the issues of the expert KM, uh, the KMD experts that we have in the world, come out boldly, come out publicly. These are the people who will champion us and it's important we just see how we can work with them. So, I would end there and let the team uh, come up with other issues, but I will definitely discuss the rest as we continue to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Euphrasia. I'm sure that people are feeling really inspired and, and motivated now to, to um, really have a good discussion. I think that Sarah just posted your article uh, Nancy is applauding you, everyone it can, can applaud you. Um, but I think Sarah just posts, posted your the article that you referred to. Um, can I just ask someone also to post Bruce's Bruce Boy's article? Perhaps you you froze here if you have the if you had the link because people have been asking for that. Um, okay, so uh, we've actually gone over time, but what you were saying was so fantastic, I didn't want to interrupt you. So let's sort of try to condense a little bit. We had 10 minutes, but we'll keep it a bit shorter to, um, if, if people would like to ask Euphrasia questions or um, make, make contributions to the discussion, please uh, raise your hands or put um, comments in the, your comments or questions in the chat and Jorge and I will be uh, monitoring that. Thanks again, Euphrasia. Um, we have Shastri. Yes, yes uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for such presentation in Fraser. I have a question that I want to put across to you on decolonization. Should it be decolonization of knowledge or decolonization of ways of knowing? Because I find knowledge, you know, trying to, I think if you try to decolonize knowledge, you'd be overkilling, but possibly the way of knowledge for me could be the best because, you know, it is what determines, what the way of knowledge, knowing is the way, is, is the process that actually results in knowledge. 
So do we deal with process or we deal with outcome? Thank you. Um, Jorge, I was going to go for another hand. I can see Alejandro Balanzo. Hi, everyone. Greetings from Colombia. Eufresia, I, I would like uh, you maybe if you reflect also in, in the colonial mindsets. Um, my, my, my point of, uh, I start this, this, this question uh, because I know that in our countries, we also have some of uh, our own people that shares the colonial mindset. And, they, and, they, and then this is not just about us and them, but us and us. And maybe I would like you to reflect a little bit on, on that. What, that. what does it mean to, to, to live, to share, to discuss with, uh, with others that, that share a colonial mindset? And uh, before there's a third person, uh, John Joseph, do you want to ask a question also before we give the floor to Euphrasia? John? Okay. Um, okay. Hello. Good evening, all. Good morning. Um, my name is John, and uh, I'm a knowledge management. I, th I think you are mute. Uh, sorry, John, you're, you're muted. Please repeat your question. No, but you're mute again. Yeah. You can you can hear me now? Yes, go. Okay, um, I just want to respond to you. Uh, sorry, my name is John from Kenya and I'm a knowledge, knowledge management expert. And I maybe just want to respond to Euphrasia. Um, I've uh, had a lot of experience, and uh, I mean, regarding on knowledge management issues. And for I think the issue, the biggest issue we've had in Kenya is mostly people who are taking up knowledge management issues are more of especially when uh, Euphrasia is requesting for people who can be able to tell the story, the Kenyan story. The issue that the people who have been taking up this issue of knowledge management in Kenya most, mostly is there are so many quacks in Kenya, and uh, maybe that's maybe usually what's your that's usually the gap here, and maybe to uh, add on to what Euphrasia has said um, because I think I have an idea of about uh, I have an idea of rural work. I mean Washington rural because I think. Uh, my wife is an AM and is a is a wash wash expert in Kenya, and uh, we've always discussed about these things. How do we how for the issues dealing with issues of uh, rural wash in this country for I mean for quite some years, but now I think he's doing other things. And these are some of the issues that have been coming up. What are we going to do? What is what what are knowledge management experts going to do to fill this gap, especially in for for the wash programs that are running currently be running in Kenya? And uh, Eurasia was right. Uh, by saying that uh, many times uh, their story has been, is being told by other people. So who is here in Kenya to tell our stories? Who's this uh, African or the Kenyan to tell the Kenyan story about, uh, I mean, rural wash and about wash? So, I mean, that's where now um, people like Eurasia need to come up and look for knowledge management experts who are in Kenya. And uh, unfortunately, sorry, maybe sometimes you're not, we don't get the, I mean, the leeway. Uh, uh, I've had an advantage of, of participating in the drawing up of the, uh, the KM strategy or rather framework for Kenya and uh, the Kenyan government. And there's so much we've done. We have a strategy already. We have a policy that is already in draft form waiting for it to be approved by the Kenyan government. And maybe I would uh, maybe add duration maybe now to maybe get in touch and to sort of can work. We also have a knowledge management uh, uh, committee for knowledge management Africa, which it's, uh, we am part of the technical committee members. So. I think those are some of the issues that we can address maybe with the help and discussions from other, I mean, partners. So the conversation is, we are here in Kenya that who can tell the story. It's only that if we are, not, we are looking too far, let's look around and you'll get the people. Thank you. Euphrasia, would you like to, to um, comment, uh, respond to, to these three issues, questions? 
Indeed, thank you so much. Thanks for the great questions as well. I'll start with the one from Jeru, the first one. Um, I would say uh, ways of knowledge would definitely be what you can be able to, to concentrate on. After all, for me, I believe with uh, I believe on the means justifies the end. So that that is what I would respond to on your issue. And then from the gentleman from Colombia, there is an interesting writer called Escobar. He said, um, development is never neutral and continues by cautioning that attempts to deny this simply adhere to a teleology that reproduces endlessly the separation between the reformers and those to be reformed. That is one thing that we need to all agree. And at the same time, this is why I usually push uh, for inclusive development when we are discussing on issues of decolonization and KMD. We are acknowledging as Southerners that we could not be the best with everything. And with that fact, it means that we need help from other people. And we're not saying that this is a conversation of them versus us, but we are saying that this is a conversation of us. And that's why I also quoted the, 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 the terminology by South Africans. They say Ubuntu, I am because we are. As I said at some point, we are losing a lot of taxpayers' money from the Northerners with bad wash projects in the country. So if we cannot be able to address the issues of decolonization, then it means even the person in the North should not be comfortable with, where, uh, with, with whatever is happening. And I'm aware of what you're talking about. I remember there's a platform that my article was shared on, and there's someone from the North, uh, actually a few people from the North who complained bitterly, and they said, if Africans are tired of our funding or our donor support, then maybe we should just stop <laughs> and, and put our money maybe in developing our countries and all, you know? But I don't think that really helps. Uh, when you look at issues to do with climate change, for instance, you cannot say that you're managing it on your own as a country. It's a global challenge. So it requires like all of us to get on board. Um, if, if we, if we, if, okay, let me just stop there and let the conversation go on. Uh, maybe, after, maybe after people's contributions, we can be able to mm -hmm. add more. Thank you. Jorge, just wanted to, to mention in the, the, there's, there's some interesting things going on in the chat. I encourage people to, to have a look. We're actually running out of time for this part of the session, but I did want to just bring attention to a couple of really interesting comments slash questions um, that uh, uh, Euphrasia may want to just very quickly address, but certainly can be discussed in the groups. Uh, from Anne Hendricks Jens Jenkins, um, as a person who wants to be a helpful ally, I know that's a fraught role. Any more guidance on what that looks like or pitfalls? Then we have a, a, a comment from um, Kingo Mchombu. Mchombu. Um, what about the issue of power and power and powerlessness as part of this discussion? Can colonials be from the same country? So Jorge, what would you like to do here? Yeah, I would like to bring those ideas and those uh, questions to the groups. We're going to divide ourselves into different groups because, uh, yeah, there's really a, lo a lot to, to think of and to discuss further. Um, we are going to form groups, and I would like to invite you all to, um, well, first of all, let me share my screen, to, to use this uh, Jamboard platform, which you have probably used uh, before. You must be able to see my screen at the moment. Yes, um, I will share the, the link for this, but you know how we you use it. You pick one of these little squares and you just uh, share your idea. We have uh, different pages for the different groups, so we will be uh, put into groups, try to find out what is the number of your group, and then you just scroll you can see that we have different pages. So you go to the number of your group together with your um, um, uh, colleagues and then put your ideas on this page so that we can keep it and you can also uh, keep it for further. Welcome back everyone. I think I think we're all here. I hope um, hope you didn't have too many problems with with Jamboard. Can that was great, Helen. Can everybody nod their heads or shake their heads, please? Everyone's nodding their heads. Fantastic. 
Great. Oh, we've even got someone from Australia here. Wow. That's uh, that's great. Um, oh, that's, that's Gladys's fault. <laughs> I know that accent. Um, okay, so what we wanted to do is just sort of ask two random people, so hold your breath, um, to just give us a, a little bit of feedback, just a, just a minute or so on what what um, happened in your group. Um, I think I would like to ask, uh, where are we? Maybe I can see there. Wow, there's so many people. Um, Srividya, Srividya Harish, would you like to tell us a little bit about the discussion in your group? Uh, thanks, Helen. So uh, uh, at the risk of sounding very discourteous, John uh, in our team had really good points. So can I hand over? Of course. Because I, I want him to say it himself. Of course. Uh, okay, um, I, I won't have my video on Srividya. This is a nice surprise. <laughs> um, uh, but remembering the points, the first one we spoke about um, being uh, to be proactive to reach out to colleagues, regardless of location, so that we should be reaching out to colleagues in the north, in the south, and vice versa and then work together to co-create or co-produce some uh, knowledge products because we realize that knowledge work has standards. This is something we can't miss. Now, these standards have to be borrowed and contextualized to come up with something that is universally acceptable. So uh, one point we had was about being proactive as a person to reach out. The other point is uh, about uh, um, self-awareness and uh, being reflective about our own capabilities, strengths, so that it is not just a whining uh, exercise. You see, a, a lot of whining has happened in the Global South about colonization. Mm. And when you get fixed into that state of mind, you don't become progressive. So the bit about being self-aware, working on your strengths, and reaching out. One example we cited is about the volume of very good quality research uh, that is sitting in the universities that is not digitized. And so when even when university ranking happens, universities in the global south rank poorly, not that research is not going on, but simply because they, there are no online repositories that are actively populated with the right content to give authors visibility and so on and so forth. The other one was about uh, taking advantage of coaching and mentoring. And in this case, we are talking about two-way exchange of knowledge. We cited something, uh, there is this organization called Author Aid, which pairs, um, you can go into Author Aid register, look for your domain, and then you will be matched with um, experts in your area. So it is like the expert, expert um, uh, database where you are matched with people in your domain of interest. And then there you can inspire each other, uh, co-create, uh, share and cross fertilize, regardless of whether Global South or Global North. Um, Scott, do you, uh, Scott, would you want to say something? Um, uh, there's a point I think I'm missing. Well, well, well I, I think you did a great job. Um, thank you. I, I really appreciated the point that you raised earlier in our discussion about um, it, coming back to the individual and who you are and how it's going to be circumstantial to um, where you're located, who you are, and many other factors. So thank you. 
I, I would like to invite all of you, of course, to go to the other groups. If you if you scroll on the pages of the Jamboard, you can also see what other people have been or what other groups have been discussing. And you can do that. In the meantime, I would like to also to invite a colleague of mine on the core group of km for dev to share his ideas. Tony, would you share some ideas of what you discussed in your group also? Yes, uh, th thanks, Jorge. Um, interesting conversation that um, we had in our group. And uh, I think we also recognize the point that um, this broader topic of decolonizing uh, development uh, beyond decolonizing knowledge management um, has become a buzzword in the international, in both international and local um, development. And uh, clearly there are many debates on what this could mean to various um, disciplines. Uh, Euphrasia mentioned uh, the importance of KM in, 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 in WASH, uh, but there's the example that came in about decolonizing aid effectiveness, especially because aid in itself is, 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 is integral to uh, ensuring that um, KM functions, you know, uh, can, can, can move on all through the value chain of how knowledge is captured, how knowledge is processed, how knowledge is shared and um, put into a practice, practical um, use. And there was the interesting anecdote uh, that relates to the COVID pandemic and the extent to which the COVID pandemic has put in place certain um, the containment measures to, to, to COVID have had certain unintended consequences, especially with regard to restrictions to travel. And looking at the example from um, development organizations, both bilaterals, uh, multilaterals, and other development organizations, it's basically meant restrictions in travel that has then implied that um, what was previously perceived to be um, imbalance flows in terms of uh, parachute um, consultants, um, especially from the north to the south, uh, have been affected. But the, 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 the jury is still out there you know, as to um, what the long-term um, impact would be. But that then triggered a um, very interesting um, discussion that uh, the focus also shouldn't really be on the who, but also on the how, uh, brings us back to the question that um, Shastri Njeru had raised um, much earlier. You know, should the focus be on um, process or, or 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 outcome? And fortunately, I think one one thing that uh, was very apparent is that there's not been that much time to to thread through this 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 issues and hopefully. At the close of this uh, knowledge cafe, we can continue to have some healthy um, debates on the KM for Dev online um, platform. But the takeaway from this really is that yes, I mean it is it is it is important um, at the end that uh, the 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 there should be a stronger voice given to 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 the marginalized. I think I'll end it there so that I can allow others to have something to say to thank you thank you yeah I, I i like what you say it's not just the individuals also what and so must also look at the how at the steps we need to take well as individuals but also as a community as groups as organizations i would like to take on this to invite uh, our next speaker he's uh, charles dewa which uh, i think all of you know of course he's uh, based in zimbabwe he's chief executive officer of knowledge transfer africa which uh, he founded several years ago um, and which he, through which he provides a, a knowledge uh, platform and with knowledge services um, he's also a member of the km for dev uh, core group charles i don't see you on my screen but you're there yes i can see you <laughs> Please. 
Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, uh, let me just start by thanking you, Fresia, for setting the scene for an interesting conversation. Uh, I've been a member of Camp for Dev since 2008, and all along I've been asking myself, how do I add value? How do I change? You know, what is that I can bring to the global south? So for this particular discussion, I just said, let me just maybe say. I'm working on energizing pathways for decolonizing knowledge in the global south. I think we need pathways for some of these things so that we avoid the whining that uh, my colleague John was talking about to say we've been whining about decolonization. What do we do about it? So I work in agriculture, mainly I work in the mass markets. When I come to Nairobi, I always visit mass markets to see how people are buying their food in the streets, not the supermarkets. So I see a lot of knowledge there. So I also work with supermarkets to see what is it that they are doing, what are the interface knowledge. So from that space, I also work with farmers who produce food and say, ah, here they may not speak English, they may not write papers, they may not research, but they have so much knowledge which they are communicating in different ways. So to me, I think KM is more than just being able to read and write. It's really what you do, how you practice it. So that's how I'm trying to bring it down to people and energize everyone to participate. So in the course of my work, one thing that I've come across is the realization that there's been so much coercion uh, in, the, in the global south. Uh, farmers and even policymakers have been coerced into different types of knowledge, like hybrid foods, fertilizer and everything. It's good in some way, but what it has done is it has killed the local knowledge, local food systems have been threatened. Right now we are trying to, because of climate change, there are efforts to bring back what has been lost. We are, we are really struggling because the coercion has been so long. Since 1923, uh, hybrids have been coming into Africa, uh, fertilizer. So there's a whole promotion of certain ways of producing food, certain ways of you know, uh, you know, preparing meals and everything which really needs to be reversed. So for me, I think that's where we can start to say from a, on a daily basis, how do we change this? We, we can take the good part, but we also need to bring up the local knowledge that has been really suppressed for more than a century. So I'm looking at different pathways of doing that. One thing that I've noticed is that in Africa, ideas can come, even right now, development actors are in Africa, pumping in ideas, bringing in all kinds of, you know, things using donor money, of course. Uh, people are tired now of some of the ideas. There's been so much recycling of if approaches. And the, what communities do, they just come and listen and say, yeah. But when they go back home, they just pack it aside and go back to what they are used to, especially when coping with climate change. We've seen a lot of now going back to knowledge, local knowledge, trying to find out where it is. So these are something that I see when I, in my space that I work with, even in mass markets. Yes, people can talk about food coming from supermarkets and all these processing companies, but you find that African mass markets are the ones that have got the diversity of food that is important for local nutrition. Local people, they depend on that, but it doesn't receive much attention from policymakers. So we're trying to reverse that. Maybe to take it forward, to just say, as a Camp for Dev member, I've been trying to look at all these things and say, how do we energize each other to sort of really be practical about it? So I've got some few notes that I've just put for the purpose of this conversation. I think the one I thought each one of us can identify an avenue for decolonizing knowledge in your respective work, whatever you're doing, even if you have retired, you can you still have a lot of knowledge to share. So if you can critically sit, you can almost identify an avenue for decolonizing. Say, how do I change the way I'm doing things? I think this is very key. So each one of us can identify a pathway of doing that. The second one is to just persuade development agencies and the funders. There's still a lot of money coming from the north into Africa. But how do we change that so that it promotes genuine knowledge exchange? There's so much knowledge in the global south, even about, about uh, different types of medicines, different types of herbs that could probably contribute to the development of future herb, future vaccines. I'm sure we have an opportunity there to tap into the global south. There's a lot that needs to be really researched. If you go to DRC, there's so much that happened there, Kenya, even everywhere else. 
there's so much knowledge that we can really tap into. We may not use the academic route only, but even talking to local people, people who may not even go to school, there's knowledge. We need to find ways of tapping into that. So I think to me, that, that's another issue. The third one is we need to, exp to explore alternative knowledge ownership models. Who owns the knowledge? Whose knowledge is it? I think to me, that's a key one. Uh, one of the things that's happening is that when somebody publishes a paper, it's like he is the one who owns the knowledge. But what about the people who are contributing ideas? What about the key informants? To me, it looks like the real people who advise, who really provide knowledge to the researcher are the ones who own the knowledge. What the researcher does, owns is a paper. But the people who are contributing knowledge, actually, they still own the knowledge that they were being interviewed about. So these knowledge ownership models, to me, I think we have an opportunity to explore those. I'm sure we can really, it, it can go a long way in helping us to decolonize knowledge. And maybe the last one is let's encourage young people. I, I, I worry a lot because I don't see a lot of young people in the development sphere. One of the reasons is because development is driven by people who most of people have retired. They come from the global north. No, no, it's not, I'm not, I don't intend to be, you know, to be negative. It's good to bring experience. But where are the young people? We don't have the Mark Zuckerbergs in the in development, young people who can really innovate and see the future. You know, I'm, I'm imagining if these young people were a part of the people who model development, we could have a different way of looking at things. Even if we have young people engage them to do, to evaluate some projects, I, I'm sure it will be different from if you hire an expert who has been there for years, nearly because they've got experience. But then we need technical expertise and the passion for doing it. So I think young people, to me, this is to me the last thing I am thinking. So these are, to me, these are the promising directions that I think if we can follow them as knowledge management for development practitioners, perhaps we could contribute a lot to decolonizing knowledge. There's a lot to be said about this topic, but I'm sure I can stop here for now. Fantastic. Uh, many thanks, Charles. Uh, thanks for your words and, and for these very concrete ideas and suggestions. What I would like to do is uh, not, not to ask you, not to invite questions to you right now, but I would like to bring, uh, invite everybody to go to groups again and to explore in the groups these issues that you are raising. For example, if we want to persuade development agencies or if we want to encourage young people, how do, can we do that as members of km for deaf or as a community. How do we do that? Now, I would like to explore this and then we come back to after the, the, the group's uh, questions to you. So Alice, if you help me, uh, we will create groups again and I will invite everybody to do. Unfortunately, we always run out of time, isn't it? I, we were having a nice discussion and we would like to continue. Um, before I invite somebody to give a comment, I would, we would like to do a, a short exercise. You've been discussing what can we do as KM for Deaf. So I would like you all to um, go to the chat. And while you go there, think what is the most interesting idea you heard? What is the most interesting idea that uh, you've been talking about? Or as an answer to the question, what can we do as KM for Deaf? So I would like you all to type it into the chat. Don't press enter yet, just type it and let us all press together and see what we come. And on the basis of that, let us have a short discussion. Yes, everybody typing. Okay, let us press enter. Let us see, what can we do? I would like you all to look into the chat and see and, and compare your ideas with what other people are saying. I see, for example, we talk about capacity building, we talk about fellowships, we talk about uh, having KM for Dev to convene a broader discussion, perhaps that's the way we're doing now. Yes. Advocacy through groups like interaction trying to work with them, networking with university students. Would somebody like to 
looking at this, would somebody like to, to comment, add an idea, mention something? I have a comment. Yes, Anna, please. Um, I just think that we can, um, you know, the decolonization thing or some of these more uncomfortable discussions, they tend to be more emotional or um, people are just talking. But what I see here is everybody proposing using good knowledge management practices for yet another important uh, topic and kind of taking some of that uh, edge off of it and just like working through it like uh, rational adults who are trying to do things better. So I really admire all of these comments in this group for this uh, tone that's coming through. Oh, nice, good, good, thanks. Chris, you want to say something? Yeah, just a thought that there are general principles that I see here and uh, there, good general principles and they'll take a lot of time. Um, what can km for dev specifically do as opposed to other organizations? And what can it do tomorrow? Uh, I think we need to look for things like that. Any other comments? Yes, from, uh, for me, uh, Jorge. Please. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, I find extremely important is that we don't talk about good knowledge and bad knowledge. I, mm -hmm. uh, I feel that there is uh, quite a lot of, um, um, uh, we need to be very careful to say that there are things that are coming from the, from the wrong places uh, uh, uh. and uh, not good, uh, good knowledge. I think we need to, to, to focus in a positive manner in creating a pool of knowledge that fits into the context in which the knowledge is being used. And that is my biggest concern at the moment. Okay. Reactions, please don't, don't wait for me to name anybody. Mm. We have a, a very, very few minutes with a lot of ideas, which of course makes it very difficult. But this is of course a starting of a discussion or a continuation of a discussion. Um, there's a lot of things which got, have come up in the chat and there's a lot, I, I invite you again to go back into the different groups in the different Jamboard pages and see what's been written. And of course we have to continue. I would say that that's perhaps the best uh, summary of everything is that we have to continue addressing these issues as a community, mm. continue having this type of discussions. Jorge, me. Yes. Um, what I see here is, uh, is, a, is a potential to unpack things. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of uh, practice that need to be better, be better seen. And I would say that would be knowledge management practice itself uh, and then unpacking processes, uh, unpacking uh, pilots, uh, attempts, uh, trials, tests, uh, where different different knowledges and different uh, uh, pro knowledge products come to scene and then feedback different actors. Uh, that that's what I see here, and I think uh, there is there's a lot of space for us to do something there. That is true. No, there's a lot of space there, I, and, and we are committed as a community and as a group, of course, to continue with this, not just through these cafes, but through the, well, the email discussions of which you are all a part of. So I would encourage you all to start with this, not uh, responding to the emails and sharing your ideas uh, in the way you're doing right now, also through the emails. We have to... Uh, Can I respond to uh, Alejandro? Sure. Um, I think that, that the whole concept of what he promotes is the unpacking of knowledge. I think that is a really important point that he's, re that he's raising. I think that um, at, like, often we present 
knowledge and like in the in 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 the uh, in the in, in the the how do you call it in English the, the 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 paper that you wrap things in as a present and you say okay this is the knowledge that I give and I wrap it for you in a very nice manner and with a, with a, a beautiful package and I give it to you and I think that is a very strong metaphor that he's using. So let us not look at that um, uh, that beautiful package that we offer it in. No, let's let us unpack it and say, okay, what is really this type of knowledge that is being offered to us? Does it fit us? Yes or no? Does it? Don't do we like it? Yes or no? And only through this unpacking process we can really appreciate that knowledge. And I really love that, uh, that metaphor that Alejandro is, uh, is offering us. So don't take it as it comes. No, open the package up and assess whether you like it or not. And like, um, and like we, uh, and we saw in, the, in the, the first speaker and say, okay, People are coming uh, from the north to us, and they are not talking about the situation of the uh, the, the worst uh, the worst problem in in Kenya. No, let's unpack it and see. Pick what is interesting for us, and build that up in the local knowledge and local practice that we uh, that we want to use. It. And I think that is a very very powerful uh, concept that uh, Alejandro is offering us. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jorge, can I just, uh, Marcello speaking, I have a, a very quick comment, uh, a follow up on what Victor just said. Um, I, I agree a lot on what he said, uh, but I would say this is just half of the argument, uh, because when we are talking about the colonization, one of the issues is that uh, the people who like, the people who decide what is knowledge fit for purpose, are not the local people and uh, or are not the, the, the people or where the communities where we are producing that knowledge. And I think this is the, the, the key aspect when we try to decolonize knowledge that uh, uh, who is to decide what is good, no uh, what is knowledge fit for purpose, what is knowledge that we like. Uh, and the problem in the colonization is that up to now, it was people in the north. It was donors in the north, it was organization in the north, academic institutions in the north. So I, I think that this is the, the difficult part and what we need to do for the future. Change this, uh, this direction and giving others uh, uh, these, these opportunities and this privilege, let's call it this way. Over. This is just the start of a discussion and certainly not the end. Um, Sarah. I would like to invite Sarah Cummings to say a few words. Yeah, I just wanted to say a few words. I think this has been really a fantastic event. And from out the team who've been organizing it, the idea is that we will compile all of these ideas. We will discuss them further in further knowledge cafes. And the idea I think is that we will have a working group to look at what the priorities will be take forward. And when we start putting that together, obviously, we'll be doing a call to everybody on KM for Dev and there'll be a broad participation. And, um, and Janetta will also be telling us about the next, um, the further consultation, which will be, taking, will be taking place, but we'll be trying to build then in a participatory manner, really a roadmap of things that, of activities that we can do together. Thanks a lot, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, we run out of time now in this meeting, but of course, the discussion continues. And uh, you're still the, have the link for the Jamboard for whatever is written there. And of course, you have all this uh, pos uh, the possibility of continuing with the email on the community. I would like to thank you as everybody, but especially I would like to thank you, Frasia and Charles, for their initial uh, ideas. I would like to thank Helen who helped me facilitate this and of course Alice and everybody else in the team. Um, and I would like to give the floor to Ginetta to close this uh, very interesting meeting. You are there, are you? I think I saw Ginetta leaving actually.
Oh, did she? Oh, uh oh. Um, well, it is just, uh, let me share my screen then. Jeanette is still there. Jeanette, are you there? I don't know. But uh, in any case, it is just a, 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 you know, all these links. I think you can see them in my screen. Um, oh, no, not this. Sorry. Yes. These are all the ways in which we communicate as a, as a community. Of course, you know most of them. The idea is that we can continue these discussions with the uh, emails uh, going through the dgroups platforms, but also with the wiki, with the journal. And of course, we also have a Twitter and a YouTube channel where all these different ways in which we can continue being in touch. Yes, so I encourage you to, um, of course, join us and join the discussion and help us feed the discussion continuously. Um, we will continue with uh, the cafes. We will continue with this discussion on decolonization, especially for uh, the uh, Asia, Australia, and Middle East focus. This will be led by uh, some of you who are here. And um, please stay tuned and join us and, and help us continue. So with this, yeah, we have to thank you everybody for your participation and, and thanks a lot for, for all your ideas and all your suggestions and your participation.